To begin with, let us again take up that region in the tree of life that we know best because it is still particularly vigorous today and because we belong to it, the main branch of the chordates. A first characteristic of this grouping appears, brought to light by paleontology a long time ago. From layer to layer, in massive leaps, the nervous system is continually in the process of developing and concentrating. Who is not familiar with the example of those enormous dinosaurians in whom the ridiculously small cerebral mass formed only a narrow string of lobes with a diameter less than that of the marrow in the lumbar region? These conditions are reminiscent of the conditions prevailing below in the amphibians and in the fishes. But if we move now to the stage above, what a change we find in the mammals. In the mammals, that is, in the interior of the same layer this time, the brain is on the average much more voluminous and folded than, and folded than in any other group of vertebrates. And yet, if we look at the layer in more detail, again, what differences there are, and above all, what organization in the distribution of differences? There is, first of all, a gradation according to the position of biotas. Cerebrally, the placentals have overtaken the marsupials in nature today. And next, within the interior of the same biota, there is a gradation according to age. In the lower tertiary, the brains of the placentals, except for a few primates, can be said to be always relatively smaller and less complicated than from the neogene onward. The same can be definitely observed on the extinct phyla, such as the dinocerates, horned mon monsters whose cranial box did not much exceed in the smallness and spacing of lobes the stage reached by the reptiles of the secondary uh, geological age. Such also as the chondrolarths, but this same thing can still be observed right within the interior of the same lineage. The brain in the Eocene carnassials, for example, when it is still at the marsupial stage, is smooth and well separated from the, cere from the cerebellum, and the list could easily be extended. Generally speaking, whatever ray is chosen on any verticel, and speaking of the phylogenetic tree, if the ray is long enough, only rarely can we observe that it does not, in time, end up in more and more cephalized forms. Let us skip now to another main branch, the branch of the arthropods and the insects. We find the same phenomenon. Here the values are not so easy to estimate, because we are dealing with another type of consciousness. Yet our guiding thread still seems to hold true. From group to group and age to age, these forms themselves, which are psychologically so different from us, like us, are subject to the influence of cephalization. Nerve ganglions curl up. They become localized and enlarged forward in the head. And at the same pace, instincts become more complicated. At the same time as well, extraordinary phenomena of socialization are exhibited. It would be possible to pursue this analysis indefinitely. I have said enough about it here simply to indicate that once we have grasped the right thread, the tangle is unraveled. In classifying organized forms, naturalists, for obvious reasons of convenience, are led to use certain variations of ornamentation or also certain functional modifications of bony apparatus. Guided by orthogenesis, as it affects wing coloration and venation, or disposition of limbs or pattern of teeth, their classification sorts out the fragments, or even the skeleton, of a structure in the living world. But because the lines drawn in this way express only the secondary harmonics of the evolutionary movement, the system does not take on shape or motion as a whole. On the contrary, the moment that the measure or parameter of the evolutionary phenomenon is sought in the elaboration of the nervous system, not only does the multitude of genera and species fall into place, but the entire network of vertices, layers, and main branches lifts up like a trembling spray. 
not only does the distribution of animal forms according to their degree of cerebralization exactly follow the contours imposed by systematics the ordering of the tree of life but it also confers on the tree of life a depth a sharpness of feature and an impetus in which it is impossible not to see the sign of truth such coherence and i may add such ease inexhaustible fidelity and evocative power of coherence could never be an effect of chance among the infinite modalities in which the complications of life are dispersed the, differenti the differentiation of nervous substance stands out as a significant transformation the way our theory foresaw it would it provides a direction and consequently proves that the evolutionary movement has a direction. This is to be my first conclusion. Now this proposition has its corollary. In living beings, the brain is the sign and the measure of consciousness. This was our starting point. In living beings, we added just now, the brain proves to be continually perfecting itself over time to the point where a certain quality of brain seems to be fundamentally bound to a certain phase of duration. The final conclusion emerges by itself, a conclusion that both verifies the basis of my account and governs what follows. Since the natural history of living things, in its totality and along each branch, outlines exteriorly the gradual establishment of a vast nervous system, this means that it corresponds interiorly to the installation of a psychic state in the very dimensions of the earth. Fibers and ganglions on the surface, consciousness deep within. All we sought was a simple rule to organize the tangle of appearances. Now we possess, fully in accordance with our initial assumption that the nature of the evolutionary movement was ultimately psychic, a fundamental variable capable of following the true curve of the phenomenon in the past and perhaps even of defining it in the future. Does this solve the problem for us? Yes, almost, but clearly on one condition, a condition that will seem hard for certain scientific prejudices, that by a chance, that by a change or reversal of level, we leave the outside in order to move to the inside of things. Part 2. The Rise of Consciousness Let us go back, then, to the expansional movement of life as we saw it in its main outlines. But this time, instead of getting lost in the maze of arrangements affecting the tangential energies of the world, let us try to follow the radial progress of its internal energies. Everything becomes definitely clear in value, in function, and in hope. A. Thanks to this simple change of variables, what we see, to begin with, is what place the development of life occupies in the general history of our planet. Above, after having discussed the origin of the first cells, we estimated that if their spontaneous generation occurred only once in the course of time, this was apparently because the initial formation of protoplasm had been linked to a state through which the general chemistry of the Earth passed only once. We then said that the Earth must be seen as the seat of some global and irreversible evolution, more important for science to consider than any other of the current oscillations on its surface, and that the primordial emergence of organized matter marks a point, a critical point, on the curve of this evolution. After that, the phenomenon seemed to be lost in a proliferation of branching structures we almost forgot about it. Now it emerges again, with and in the tide, duly registered by nervous systems, that carries the living wave toward ever more consciousness. We see the great fundamental movement reappear. And now, and we now grasp its sequel. Uh, part three coming up.